Okay guys, we'll presume that if you're in this room now, you're in this room for track one. Uh, we're uh, super privileged to have Tim Bennett here. And I don't know if you know Tim, but obviously he's the founder and the principal consultant for Red Siege. Um, he's got plenty of history, whether it's the SANS MS ISC program director or uh, author faculty for IANS, or you might also know him for basically something legendary called Kerber Roasting. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, I'd like to introduce Tim to, uh, to kick off this conversation about blue being blue. And uh, all yours, sir. Cool. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for, so much for coming out. Uh, big thank you to all the sponsors that, that make this possible. By the way, I like to do my presentations a little bit backwards. So if you want the slides, just go to redseeds.com slash blue. For some reason, AT&T will not let you go to redseeds.com, but www.redseeds.com. It's a weird. Anybody work at AT&T? Because we can talk and I'll buy you a lot of beers to fix that. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, but feel free, if you want the slides, if you're like halfway through, like this isn't interesting to me, grab the slides and leave. I don't know. It doesn't matter me anything, right? Uh, cool. So what, what, I, what I want to talk about here, um, well, brief background of me, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I, I'm an instructor with, with SANS. I'm a co course uh, lead now for the, the network penetration testing course. Um, teach the 660, IANS faculty, all the stuff that he kind of said. I've uh, been doing pen testing, offensive things, <laughs> from many perspectives for uh, a number of years now. But what I wanted to do, now how many of you, first off, how many of you are, uh, consider yourself blue team members? I like how like, there's one blue guy in the front, otherwise blue is hiding in the back. That's, uh, I feel like that tells me something. Who's my red team, people? You guys are okay, like four of us, fantastic. Who is green, plaid? Any other colors? Who's, who's like, why am I at this conference? My spouse or my, my dad dragged me here? Nobody? Right, um, I'm purple. Oh, yeah, we had to use some buzzwords in here too. Who works on the blockchain? <laughs> or uh, next generation AI? No, no, no. Oh, there he is. Cool. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to talk through now, I got my start. We, we didn't have a lot of pen testing back in the day. Right, I, I, and I've been doing this for a number of years, and I want to sort of tell you kind of a little bit of, of my story, how to get into the, the offensive arts, if you will, um, and some cool things you can do on the blue side if you want to play with some of the, the, the red tools and techniques, both to make your organization more secure, but also because it's, it's, it's kind of a, a lot of fun, right? And I, I find that the best red teamers oftentimes start off with that blue background. And it doesn't even have to be a defensive security role, it could be a systems administrator. My background is systems administration, network engineering. When people understand the guts of those technologies, it means now they're pen test, they're red teaming, they can really dig into the guts of it. And then afterwards, they can make recommendations to the recipients of those reports and that information and talk to them at their level. Right? And have some, some sort of soul, if you will, behind their recommendations because they used to be in the, tr the trenches. And they understand that, other than just having sort of that, that red team perspective. Um, so, I, I'm a red teamer, right? My company that I've got, we do red teaming, but let's be, let's be honest here. There's, there's nothing special about the red team. In fact, the only team, and the red teamers are like, yeah, we are. Now, the only reason that red exists is to make the blue team better. And if we fail to do so, we are a giant waste of time and money. Right? We like to show up like, a, like you know, uh, like the fighter pilots in like leather jackets and come in and kick ass. Can we say that here? Yeah, fair enough. Just did. Um, right? We come in and, you know, tear the network apart, show how awesome we are, and then say, why don't you guys clean up on, on the way out? And of course, that's not super effective, right? Our, our goal is to make blue better. And if we show up and we shame them, that doesn't help anybody, right? I think literally the term purple, you guys heard the purple team concept before? Honestly, I think purple team is what red teaming should be, right? The goal of a red team is to make the blue better. And we have this purple team concept because the red team showed up, you know, made a mess of things, did some cool, fun stuff, but then just 
kind of left blue team hanging. They're like, oh, you're cool. You, you sort of shamed us and you showed us a little bit of how to move forward, but sit down with us. Help us. Right? And, and that's some of the, the goals here. The key here is that we're on the same side. Right? The red team and the blue team should not be adversaries. If we are, that's a problem. Because the sole purpose of the red team and pen testers is to make the blue team better. Right? Um, so the blue team themselves, now a lot of you work in smaller organizations. Who works in an organization where you're not maybe big enough to have pen testing team or red team? Yeah, significant number of hands, right? You know, and maybe you don't have some of the budget, or you do, and it's every so often. What you can do is we can use now some of those red team tools, red team tactics, to sort of test ourselves. Right? And of course, there's going to be a limit to that. As a blue teamer, it's not your goal to know, like, literally every single thing that, that uh, red team people do and how to use absolutely every single tool. But we can still use some of those tools in the basic ways to move the needle. One of the big problems that we see in security is that we're really good at throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If something is not 100%, we're like, let's crap, let's get rid of it. How many of you have ever heard uh, say, get rid of antivirus, it's crap? Right? That, that, that's asinine. That's crazy. It serves a purpose. It's not perfect. In fact, no technology is going to be perfect. Every one of those things is designed to move us forward just a little bit. So you don't have to be an expert in all of these sort of offensive tools. Use them a little bit. The goal is to move the needle. It's, it might be a little bit controversial. People are like, no, we have to get everything. That is ideal. But let's be realistic here as well, right? Well, I think it's about stepped out of range. There we go. Um, so some of the, the, the basic pieces here for Blue. What we need to understand as a defensive person that we don't exist in a vacuum. Right? We're working against real threat actors. What that means then is, of course, we have to understand how do the bad guys operate? Right? What are the common tools and techniques they use to get into my network, to move throughout my network, and then get the data out of my network and be persistent? And if we can find a couple of different ways to either stop the bad guy or to detect the bad guy, now we have moved that in. And we can shrink some of that detection time from what we oftentimes see from many months down to a much shorter point in time. One of the things that we like to focus on so much is protections. Right? We want that eggshell security. Like we got this super, this really tough egg, and nobody's going to get in. That's not realistic. It's not realistic because we've got zero days. Also, you ever fire anybody? You ever, you have anybody in your organizations who are upset? No one, no one's raising their hand. All right, fair. I, I'm upset, right? No. Right, you've got people at your organizations who literally could walk out the front, front door with your information, right? You've got uh, admins who could go rogue. You could get snowed in and turn it into a verb. Right, so we, we've got some of these things that we need to, of course, not only do the prevention, but we also have to do some of the detection. Those two pieces together are absolutely uh, key here. Now again, I mentioned this before, but I want to hit it on it again. We're going to show you some of the simple ways we can use these tools. Again, the goal here isn't in the next 45 minutes to make you the greatest red teamer that ever lived. If I could do that, either I'd be rich or I'd be out of a job, I'm not sure which one. Right? So we need to understand we're going to use these tools and the goal is to move the needle. Right? We want to move forward, reduce that time to detection, and maybe catch the bad guy earlier, or even better, of course, prevent them from, from uh, getting in in the first place. So we all know this, right? Passwords suck. We have so many problems with passwords. Um, one of the tremendously useful things to do is look for breached passwords, because you know what? The bad guys are doing exactly that. There's a breach at fill-in-the-blank company. The passwords are now, the passwords or password hashes are now posted online. So what happens is the bad guys go out there, find your email address for your organization or every email address for your organization, find those passwords, and then attempt to log into your company's email, VPN, 
whatever it, it, it might be. And this, it was so extremely effective. We use this all the time on pen tests. Now, as a blue team, you're like, well, that's sort of not my job. Okay, cool, whose job is it at your organization? Right, somebody needs to keep an eye on some of this. Uh, and there's really easy, simple ways, and there's a number of different services we can look at. Um, like the Have I Been Pwned, we can do some things for our entire organization. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dehash, it's $130 a year, sorry, 129 bucks a year. And I can set up alerts for my entire organization. So now if a new password is cracked for my organization, I can then know that and I can say, hey, let's try to log in as that user real quick. Because as much as we tell users to use different passwords at different locations, is that effective? No. And there's, it's impossible to have a security control, a technological control, that prevents the user from using the same password on crappywebsite.com and inside my organization. Right? There is no protection mechanism here. All we have is the ability to detect. So we want to be able to follow some of that and then check, hey, is this being used inside of our organization? Another thing that's going to be really tremendously useful inside of our organization, we need to audit some of the passwords inside our organization. Right? Perform an audit, which means we're going to have to do some password cracking. And I'm not saying here, and this might be a little bit controversial, I'm not saying you have to crack every password with like just crazy hash cat rules or John the Ripper rules. What I'm most interested in, again, we want to move that needle, right? The biggest benefit for the least cost. What I would really like to find are, what are the terrible passwords in our organization? The terrible ones, and by that I mean the ones that people can easily guess. There's a significant difference between a crackable password and a guessable password. And a lot of times we in security say, oh, well, it's crackable, it's clearly guessable. Is it? If I have to have my password cracking rig running for a week, trying multiple trillions of password attempts, how long would that take with a password guessing attack to actually run through? Right? I think we would all be retired by that point in time. So the key here is we want to find some of those bad passwords. And there are some very common bad passwords. Right? Well, one of the most common ones I see, let me back up for a second. So do uh, we have any auditors in the room? Thank God. Okay, cool. All right, so according to the auditors at your organization, I'm not picking on audit, this is recorded, right? Whatever. All right, so according to the auditors, how often are we supposed to rotate our password? Every how many days? 90, you hear a lot of 90s, right? And the reason is, you guys know the reason behind that? It's because when Moses came down from the mountain, he had a third tablet. Obviously not, right? Now the reason is it took in the 70s. In the, how many of you were never even alive in the 70s? Holy crap. Oh my God, I feel old. Yeah, so like in the 70s, it would take 90 days to crack the password. These days, we can get these water-cooled rigs with multiple GPUs. Uh, the Coal Fire guys just released a project a few years ago where you can use Amazon for relatively cheap to crack passwords at an insanely fast rate, where we can attempt you know, thousands of passwords for each human who has ever lived on the planet Earth. I mean, the speed is just astronomical. That 90 days thing is absolutely crazy. On top of that, let me bring it up, let's talk about another stat. What's the average time a bad guy is inside your organization? According to like the Verizon breach report. 240 days. Yeah, I've heard in numbers between five months to like nine months. <coughs> That's odd. If we're supposed to rotate our password every three months, why isn't the dwell time three months or less? It's because that control is basically worthless. I do pen tests all the time. It's a week, two weeks, a month. At no point in time I've been like, well, crap, we're screwed now. Steve in marketing changed his password. <laughs> Damn it, Sally. Well, why did you change your password? At no point in time has I been in Russia been like, comrade, we screwed now. That's my <laughs> terrible, terrible Russian accent, by the way. Um, right? And then this control that we have that is supposed to be effective doesn't provide much value. And we see that people, anybody ever worked the help desk on January 2nd? <laughs> You're laughing, but I think it's, there's tears behind that. What's the phone call you get nonstop that day? 
well, yeah, I can't log in. What's my password, right? So what people do is they, they, they come up with schemes to, 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 to remember these passwords. And they look outside, and we're in Kansas City, right? And look outside January 2nd, and there's snow on the ground. Or actually, we're in Kansas City, there's ice on the ground, right? <laughs> And then 90 days later, it's, you know, it's the, the flowers are coming up. And 90 days after that, it's like 110, right? So when people are like, hey, cool, I'll just look outside. I'll just use the season. So right now, we're technically, what, spring? Cool, my, my password is spring. Capital S, lowercase, pre. And then they're like, oh, crap, that's an uppercase and a lowercase. And there's a spring this year, and ideally, there's going to be a spring next year. <laughs> And they're like, man, if only there was a number I could use to differentiate this spring from next spring. And they sit there for probably 45 minutes to an hour to contemplate this deep thought. And of course they end up with... Spring 2019. Thank you for telling me your passwords, by the way, folks. Or you have to be like, oh, Tim, we have to use a special character. Cool. Spring 2019? Exclamation point. Why? Top left key on the keyboard. Right? You guys all know this. I know this. All the attackers on planet Earth know this. But we see users do this all the time. And as an attacker, I don't have to be successful with all the users. I need to be successful with one. Right? That one person that gets me to VPN, to gets me to email, to gets me on the inside. I just need the one. So if you're doing password cracking, we want to focus on these terrible passwords. Season and year. Password followed by a number. Uh, I saw some organizations, when they, a new person starts, they, they pick a password for them. I was at one organization and they started, the, your, your first password for everybody was Orange 1. What's my first guess? Orange 2. Right, because when they first log in, they're supposed to change their password. They tell them, hey, pick a secure password. And they're like, well, cool. If Orange 1 is secure, Orange 2 is twice as secure. <laughs> right? So we want to look at some of those passwords. I've seen like the F-bomb, company name, local sports teams. But find those terrible passwords for your organizations, crack those password hashes, and have those people rotate their, their passwords. And a lot of organizations are like, well, we don't crack them. We just tell people not to use those. Okay, great. Imagine the average person in your organization in a security meeting. They don't want to be there. No way. And they're like, this guy's up front, and blah, 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 don't use the season and year, blah, blah, blah. And then like three months later, they're like, I remember something, blah, 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 season and year. What a great idea. <laughs> right, so we, we need to audit. We need to come back and enforce that people are not doing some of these, these things. So how can we do some of this? Well, first off, what we need to do, uh, yep, yeah, cool. Um, we need to extract the password hashes. I was going to show you like six different slides on how to do that instead. There's a great link for you. What I can do is I can go to a domain controller and I can say, hey, why don't you give me these two files? I need ntds.dit and the system key. The system key is used to decrypt the ntds.dit. From that, I can get the password hashes. And then I can use tools like Hashcap to perform some of that cracking. Now, how far you want to go with the cracking is, is, is up to you. I would say the first step is go for the lowest hanging fruit, the fruit that's literally touching the ground, right? The season and year, the password with a number, the company name with a number. Those terrible ones, find those first. Our goal here isn't to find all the bad-ish passwords, it's to find the terrible ones that are going to be very, very easily guessable. On top of that, we can use passwords that we know have been compromised from people in our own organization. Right, going back to some of those things from like Dehashed or any number of other places, add some of those passwords to your list. Crack those passwords, right? Use some of these red team tools to tell people, hey, look, we need to send you through password training. Here's how to pick an actual good password. Now, by the way, the, the latest NIST recommendation, Microsoft, Google, etc., is not to do the stupid complexity requirements. And I say stupid because it is. Everybody knows the tricks. Instead of an A, people put what? The at symbol. Right? It's funny, I gave a talk like this at like a, a bunch of insurance people. And somebody came up to me afterwards and were like, hey, Tim, 
I don't just use the, the A app thing. You know, it's like, oh, okay. It's like, I got other ones too. I'm like, oh, tell me. <laughs> and he, he comes up to me, he's like, instead of, instead of an O, and no joke, the dude looked around. I use a zero. Like, like, like the Iranians and the South Koreans were there waiting for this moment. Like, come on, this is going to be important. And then I was like, oh. And then I'm like, hey, instead of an L, and then I felt like I need to look around as well, because I don't know what's around. I'm like, you know, is, is North Koreans here? Is Kim Jong in here? I'm like, instead of an L, do you use a one? He's like, <laughs> We had, as security people, we've literally developed an entire language for this. It's called lead speak, where we take characters and we substitute them for others. It's a method of communication. But people are using these in their passwords, and it's making their passwords trivially more complex, significantly more difficult to remember. Right? So it doesn't move the needle in the correct direction. The recommendations, of course, we want longer passwords. We don't want these complexity requirements, and we would like to get rid of uh, password rotation unless the, uh, the password is breached. Of course, two-factor is fantastic. So, anyways, going back to some of this, if we want to crack those password hashes, this is just a simple, straight-up crack. No, no bells, no whistles. I'm going to provide a list of passwords that are terrible, and we're going to give a, a, a list of password hashes, and we'll say go. And the bad passwords, we then talk to people, and we say, you need to change your password. And we can perform this on a regular uh, interval. Now, be very careful with this. If you're walking around with all of the password hashes on a USB, be careful with said USB. Right? Don't just send these things across the network and move them all over and put them on a normal system. Take this thing offline. As an attacker, I have come across a corporate cracking device. I literally logged into it. It was a Cali box. Username root, password Tor. Tor, right? T O R. Root spelled backwards, logged in, grabbed all their password hashes, and used them. I used the red team's own tools against them, and they're like, well, that's not fair. And like, one of the guys that came up to me sort of afterwards, he's like, bro, we're on the same side here. I'm red, you're red. And I'm like, I mean, I get that, but no honor among thieves. Right, so, so basic, fix the testing uh, there. Other, other techniques, now, I'm a little bit partial to this, as you probably heard in the introduction. Um, the common thing we see with attackers, with red teamers, with malware these days is something called Kerber roasting. I'm not going to go into the details of that, because literally I could talk about this for hours and I would spare, it to spare you. Um, the short version is, you can have service accounts that any user can request a ticket for. That ticket is encrypted using the password hash of the remote service. Short thing, what short version of what that means is any authenticated user on your network is able to crack some of the service accounts on your network. Service accounts usually have access to very privileged data, oftentimes have a, a, a privileged security. So we need to be very careful with things. Now, before when I was talking about users, I, I was mentioning, you know, we can we don't have to be super crazy with the cracking. Let's just focus on some of the terrible passwords. With this, because what a lot of organizations don't do is that they don't rotate as, as often for service accounts. And by often, I mean ever. Right? And these are very privileged accounts with access to very sensitive data. So with these types of accounts, what I would like to do then is do a little bit more aggressive uh, of, of a crack. So what I can do, uh, first off, to get those, those hashes, and I can see which accounts are tied um, to an SPN, as we call it, um, I can use an offensive tool here, invert, invoke Kerberos. So I can use PowerShell to extract this information and then send it to my cracker. Here I'm using a hashcat, I'm using the M13100, uh, which tells it it's Kerberos. I'm going to give it my hashes, and I'll give it a couple of options. I can give it a, a, a big list here of bad passwords. And then I can add some additional and say, you know what, let's, let's take that list and let's add three characters to the end. And let's do it again, but now let's add three characters to the beginning. And we can get, much, we can get quite in depth with the cracking here, but we want to be a little bit more aggressive. 
because the bad guys are going to do this inside your network. And remember we talked about this earlier, all the bad guy needs is a single account. Any bad guy in your, in, in your network, or frankly trusted insider, which I guess is a bad guy, can request this information and do offline cracking of your service accounts and you can't see that attack happening. Right? So, we mentioned this a little bit uh, before, but according to like, the Verizon Breach Report and others, it takes many months for people to detect a breach. Bad guy is in, bad guy is taking data, it's long gone, they get persistence, they're in the network for many months. So, it means that our protection is failing. Protection is ideal. I would like to keep the bad guy out. Right? That, that is, that's an ideal goal here. But realistically, there will be failures. If we're relying on that egg to never crack, we're going to be very disappointed when we end up with yolk everywhere. Because it will happen. We need detection. Detection is absolutely key. So we can focus some of our tools. Now a lot of people are like, oh, well, we use such and such an agent, and we've got this EDR product and this SIM. Cool. Have you tuned it? Let's test some of that against some of the real world attacks that we see out there, right? So talking about curb roasting. Curb roasting is kind of loud. So I talk about requesting information for those tickets. Great. Why is Steve in marketing or Sally in accounting, why are they all of a sudden requesting a ticket for a database server? That's not normal. And why all of a sudden is one of my engineers requesting, I don't know, all of the tickets? That's a detection mechanism, right? We need to look at some of these events. We need to tune this so that we actually get a notification here. This means something has gone wrong. Someone is now inside my network. Now let's spin up IR and try to kick them out, or a hunt team to try and figure out what exactly is going on. Something to say, let's move that needle of detection time for many months to something much, much quicker. The specific event ID that we're interested in here is going to be the 4769. Now your average users will use some of those events. You cannot just say, alert me for every one of these. Not useful. What we need to look for is atypical patterns or a large number of requests in a short period of time. Um, great reference from Sean Metcalf here on AD Security uh, on, on things to look for here. Tremendously a, a great, great blog post here, but what we want to see here is, are things out of the normal? Are there a large number? Also, are we requesting tickets that are formatted in a very specific way? Are they using RC4 encryption? Your typical system is not going to request that. It's easier and faster to crack. So if you get a single one that uses RC4, you might have some reasons on the inside. You might have to tweak this a little bit, but the vast majority of the time, someone bad is inside your network. Okay. Um, we can do some password spraying. So can we detect this? So what an attacker oftentimes is going to do is try some of those terrible passwords across your entire organization. They're going to try that season and year. This is not a password guessing attack in the traditional sense. Traditionally, we would take a single account and we would try piles and piles and piles of passwords. As an attacker and as a defender, what's the protection with that? Lockout. Right, so as an attacker, the attacker doesn't want to cause a lockout because a locked account is no longer useful. So instead, we take this and we flip it sideways and we're going to try one password for a large number of accounts. Now there's no protection against this. Now uh, Microsoft, uh, the uh, Azure AD now has protections against this, uh, but the vast majority of internal organizations do not have this configured. So because we don't have a protection, we need a detection mechanism. Hey, why all of a sudden is somebody checking passwords for every single one of my accounts? Is it coming from the inside? Is it coming from the outside? Can I restrict that? Are there additional compensating controls, like uh, two-factor, that could, could mitigate some of this? So we can try some of these tools on the inside and say, can we detect this? Right? So we, we can fire these tools up and say, hey, does this show up? Do we get alerted on this? Because this is going to be a, a bad case. 
Let's think about the mind of an attacker. The bad guys, they have kids to feed. Right? They're just like you and I, just eviler. And they have kids to feed. They like Bentleys too. Right? What do they want inside your organization? Financial information. It could be, you know, credit card information. It could be transferring money. It could be, you know, encrypting all of your stuff. Um, your, your sensitive information. We need to understand from a defensive per perspective, we don't exist in a, in a vacuum. What are we trying to defend in our castle? And then let's look for that. Are we exposing that inside of our organization? And there's some great tools that we can use for some, for some of this. We've got a number of tools with PowerView. What I can do with PowerView, now there's a, a, a newer version of PowerView. It's in the development um, uh, branch. It is not in the, the production branch yet. But a very simple PowerShell command, what it's going to do is it's going to search our network for open file shares. And then it's going to search those file shares by default for a list of files named password or login or config. And of course, we can tweak all of these things, but the very simple approach is going to say, let's look everywhere, and then let's look for these sensitive files. We've gone up against, as a red teamer at my company, we've gone up against some very difficult defenders, which is fantastic, right? The goal is to make the blue teams better. Um, and we were not able to laterally, laterally move or escalate, but instead we're like, hey, cool, let's just look around. What can we see from where we land? Think about the bad guy. If they land on the finance person's computer and all the bank account routing numbers are right there, do they need to move? No, it's all right there. If they land on the engineering workstation where they have all the CAD drawings for the super secret missile system, do they need to move? No. If they land on the marketing person's computer and they're on the file shares all over the place, there are the financials or the super secret plans, do they need to move? Again, not really. And I've seen time and time again in organizations where we've got these excessive file permissions. This is now sort of the gold mine that we go for first. Let's look around and see what we've got laying around. Uh, we had a, a, a bank absolutely killing us. We looked around and we found uh, bank accounts and routing numbers all over the place. They had all the technical controls in place to, to keep us contained, but we didn't need to move. We just grabbed it from where we sat. So useful information here. Again, sort of an offensive person's tool, tremendously useful uh, as a defender, so we can find what information is where, and we can apply the proper security controls, right? Uh, reduce access, remove access, uh, et cetera. Another thing, bad guy's gonna get in your network, he's gonna wanna move. Oftentimes, again, we don't have to, but oftentimes the bad guy wants to move from one system to another system. Great, can you detect that? If it's valid credentials, there's not going to be a security control that is going to prevent somebody from logging into systems to which they have access. But what we want to do is see, because they're, they're going to have to poke around. They may not have the full knowledge. And all of a sudden, Steve in accounting is trying to connect to all sorts of systems. Are you following up with that? Or are you just like, oh, well, Steve just fat fingered. Right? Sally just made a mistake. So what we can do is we can, we can um, attempt to log in a number of different ways that's similar to what an attacker is going to use. Very common tools that we use as offensive people, frankly as systems administrators as well, but offensive people use. PS exec. It allows me to run a program on a remote system. Same with WMIC, and there's tons of different tools that do the same sorts of things. And a bunch of different features in free tools like PowerShell Empire. Now, of course, we don't have time to go through all of PowerShell Empire. It would be like a four-hour session. But the key here is, what I want to look for is deviations in logins. Right? All of a sudden, why is Steve in accounting uh, logging into other systems that probably shouldn't be accessing? Right? If you've got the capability, why is all of a sudden Steve's login information coming from somewhere in the Ukraine? Is that normal for him? Especially when he logged into his desktop 15 minutes ago? Right, that there's no plane that gets him there fast enough for this to make sense. The successful login is a little bit more difficult. We need additional tooling to sort of monitor some of that. 
But the interesting one here is, user are not allowed to log into the computer. Now all of a sudden, Steve's trying to log into that database server. That's not typical. There is no reason that Steve needs to know that this even exists, let alone attempting to, to log in. So if we see some of these, these aren't the highest fight fidelity indicators, but it's a decent indicator, especially if we see this at breadth. If all of a sudden, Sally is trying to log in to all sorts of systems, it's likely something's gone wrong with Sally's account or Sally's computer, and we need to dig into that. Again, not necessarily for a protection, this is going to be a more on the, uh, the, the, the detection side. And there's a great um, um, post here with all sorts of other event, event IDs and great ways to, uh, to, to detect this. I uh, highly recommend checking that out. We don't have time to go uh, through all of that. So we've got you know, all these sort of useful tools used by red teamers that you and blue teamers can use. Relatively straightforward, relatively simple to use. We can use them out of the box. You don't have to turn on all of the bells and whistles. The goal here, again, is to move the needle. Right, get the biggest bang for the least cost. It's not going to necessarily to you know get absolutely everything out of it. Frankly, that's not your job, right? And, and any incremental step is a good thing, right? And we're not going to be necessarily perfect. Right? Ideally, we would give all of our end users twenty characters, perfectly random passwords. Usability of that, crap. Right? So, so we need some of these, these, uh, these ways to, uh, to detect bad guys in our network, and we can sort of try to detect ourselves. We can turn our own blue team into a mini purple team, where we go a little bit red from time to time. Right? Take a night out on the town, if you will. So with that, I want to thank you guys uh, so much for coming. Um, I've got uh, the link to the slides here. It's just a full link. It's just a, it's just a pointer to a Dropbox folder, because the Dropbox link is like this long and my shortened URL for uh, redseach.com slash blue is like this long. Uh, any questions? Just shout them out, I will repeat the question. So, oh, yes, sir. So if you can uh, crack passwords like summer uh, 2018, do you think you actually maybe just have a bad policy as a password? So his question is, if I can crack some of these bad passwords, uh, winter 2019, spring 15, whatever, um, do I have a bad password policy? Yes and no. I mean, to, to prevent people from using a bad password, I need some sort of a shim on the domain controller to say, I'm not going to allow you to select this password because it's terrible. Right? And if we don't have that sort of protection mechanism, we have to go back and audit. And you know, it meets all it, it checks all the boxes, right, with that terrible password, the uppercase, lowercase it numbers. And until we go back, it, it, it's sort of difficult to tell whether it's a terrible password or not. Well, I mean, but you need to take that to the business and say, look, 50% of our users have eight character passwords with the same number. We should increase it to one character. Yeah, so his, his question then is, can we, go, can we take that and go back to the business? I mean, yeah, you should be able to, right? I mean, this could be a political game that I'm not going to jump in the ring for you. <laughs> um, but this is going to be a discussion you'll have to have, like, look, the NIST guidelines suggest this change. Let's go to 15 characters, let's get rid of the complexity, and then it gets rid of spring 2019, because it doesn't fit. Now there will be new spring 2019s that evolve now with these longer passwords, but ideally it's gonna be much harder for them, for the attackers. Cool, other questions? We got another minute or two. Yes, sir? So what would you say to an organization that wants to put in two-factor authentication uh, to mitigate Yeah, so his, his question is related to two-factor. I think two-factor is fantastic. We gotta be careful though that two-factor is not perfect. You can still fish two-factor. People are like, oh, we got two-factor, we're totally good. No, 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 I have still fished two-factor. It just means a compromised password is now more difficult to use, right? It definitely moves that needle forward. People are like, well, it's not perfect. No, it's not. It doesn't mean we throw it out. It is a good thing to use. And it allows us to have those worst passwords sort of make their way through, but we have additional protection there as well. What cool. about getting corporate email with the two-factor? What about something corporate email two-factor? Preventing your corporate email account from being able to be used with the two-factor. 
So preventing your corporate email from being used, I always get rid of corporate email. That would be awesome. <laughs> no, I don't quite understand your question. Um, if your two-factor authentication code is being sent to your corporate email, if your account's been compromised, then that would also be uh, used to get around the two-factor as well. Oh yes, there's backup mechanisms. So his comment is sometimes there's backup mechanisms for two factor that go via insecure methods that can be used. Yeah, yeah, that's that's always an issue there as well. Cool. All right, I think we're out of time. Um, I have, I be, we'll be downstairs in the vendor area. I got a bunch of stickers that say I am offensive because. Um, if you want some of those? Can feel free. If you got questions, swing by. Uh, happy to talk to you. Um, Slide deck is on the left, uh, redsteeps.com slash blue. My contact information is on the right. Another thing I would ask you, help make us, help make this conference even better. It's a fantastic event. I love this venue, by the way. Um, but, you know, give feedback. If you think this talk sucks, cool, let me know. Tell me how I can make it better. I'm, I'm not even lying, right? Um, let us know about the conference, the event, anything else. Uh, but with that, thank you so much for attending. And, uh, have a good day.